Welcome to the MuseCast, where we squeeze every last drop of inspiration out of Sunday's sermon. Right. You look suspicious, I knew it. <laughs> you look suspicious, I knew it. <laughs> what do you mean I look suspicious? I, I'm like, I have a clean cut this... haircut. Mm, I'm wearing yeah. a corduroy freshly coat. shorn. Yeah, 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 you are freshly I... shorn. Very nice. Um, ve- yeah, and you're wearing brown sugar. Yep, yeah, but you had that little mischievous <laughs> glint in your eye right yeah. before. So um, it's not my fault that the show started out with giggling, cackling, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Not my fault. Blame that okay. guy. Oh, goodness. Okay, uh, I'm going to do introductions because I don't know. People may not know who we are, Dan. So yeah. I'm going to say, first of all, happy Muse Day. Welcome. We're glad that you're here. He's Dan Kent. I'm Shauna Boren. And the pressing question on everyone's mind, top of the show, Dan Kent, did you get in your ridiculously sized Kleenex tower? Oh, you mean my <laughs> perfectly sized <laughs> Kleenex tower? Yes. In fact, uh, ah, tomato, is. tomato, man. Yeah, see, look, see, you? look at this. See? see, listen, let's look. Look at this. See, oh see how I, I could just reach over and grab one? Because it's the perfect size. But the, hold on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Watch this. Okay. So you put the Kleenex up there. Now, what if you run out? Well, that's okay because you have extras. Oh! You have extras in there. You can just grab a new one. See that? That is clever. Clever. Yeah. Is that an is that the Musecast new sponsor, the maker of that Kleenex? Uh, you, you know, I I don't know who the maker is. It's I got it off of uh well here's the deal is I we actually it was at Thanksgiving last year. We went to Milwaukee for Thanksgiving with Barbara's family. And her mom has one of these in the bathroom. And I'm just like, that's perfect because I hate having the boxes around. And this is just like the perfect thing. So I, I found it on Amazon and I I bought it. So my life has this, been this better. Is, was that your reenactment? You found it on Amazon? I did. I, I found it. Yeah, right. Yes. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> now, kids might not know what that means. So this is, I found it no, on go, Amazon. They might. I found it on Amazon. There you go. Right. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, perfect, I would say. Perfect. I would say my, my life is at least 0.001% better since I since I've had that. So, yeah. Well, I believe that. And I know you to be a man who values time and Mm -hmm. you like to be efficient. And so right there, there you go. The only thing is, is if you have pretty Kleenex boxes, then you can't see them because they're tucked away behind a cabinet, like Rapunzel, like, you know, (laughs) Yeah. Uh, here's the problem. Like Kleenex, uh, this is probably more than people need to know, but they used to do this thing where they would have this art on the box and mm-hmm. it was like legitimate art, you know, and it was like really nice art. And then they started going with like some just like cheap prints. And it's like, well, <laughs> I like the art. Go back to the art. So now I'm, yeah. I have a little uh, tension with the Kleenex Corporation okay. right, right now. So, um, oh, okay. Well, Kleenex yeah. Corporation, don't let that diminish your desire to sponsor the show. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We'll work on reconciliation between yes. you and Dan. It's going to be yep. fine. No worries. No worries. That's right. All right, Dan. Well, mm-hmm. I do think today is a great day to discuss Sunday sermon um, yes. that Greg gave in his very, I'm going to use his word, sexy, which I don't like that word, <laughs> <laughs> right. referring to a girl <laughs> or back phrase. Yeah. But he's feeling good. He's sporting it. He's hopefully going to be out of it soon. And so you could just tell, you can just tell he's up there feeling good and happy. And he's really like just diving into this series right before we take a break for our Christmas series. So with all of that being said, and if you'll notice, I did not say the sermon title because I, I don't even know what it was. <laughs> I yeah. can't even remember what it was as per usual. So I'll leave that to you in your world famous summary. Sounds good. Well, I, I will say that uh, part of the reason why it might have been hard to remember the title is because he didn't share the slide for the title this week. 
And uh, so that makes it a little trickier, but slaughtering lies. That's the ah. title of the sermon, slaughtering lies. So, uh, and it makes sense when you, when you uh, watch the sermon uh, it, in a sense, it will ultimately make sense. But initially, you know, he really, he, we're still looking at chapter one verses four through eight. And initially he's just looking at these three sort of uh, phrases that he wants to clear up. So people understand it as we go forward. And there's a lot of that in revelation where there's just these really strange like clauses and and uh, nouns and like what do they mean and all that. So today is sort of uh, looking at three of those. Uh, the first one is uh, this idea that Jesus is coming on the clouds, and this is a, a reference back to Daniel chapter seven verses thirteen to fourteen. And and really all this means is that it, it was a way of capturing Jesus's uh, kind of majesty or his authority, um, just his transcendence, because uh, riding on the clouds was sort of this thing that the gods did. And and uh, and D both Daniel and John, now in the book of Revelation, are basically saying that he is that. That's what Jesus is, is he is that authority. He is that majesty. Uh, the second clause uh, that he looks at, that Greg looks at, is this idea that the tribes uh, that will wail when they see what they have done. And um, this is a, 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 a kind of a callback to Zechariah 12, uh, 9 and 10. And the idea here is that the, the reason why they're wailing is what's important. They're not wailing because, you know, they're afraid that God is going to smite them or or they're not wailing uh, out of out of necessarily just shame in and of itself. They're wailing because they see the precious God whom they have pierced, whom they have crushed, whom they have hurt. And um, and, and so. The, the idea is that there's there's this compassionate sort of response when they when their eyes are opened to what they have actually done to what the consequences of their behavior actually is and to see the power that they've had and the damage that they've done with that power they will wail at the out of this kind of uh deep existential grief over what they did and it's a type of wailing it's a type of response that isn't an end in itself. It is it is the prompting for something that is beautiful. It, it prompts people uh, to then repent from what they did, and um, and then ultimately it is that repentance, that turning the other way, changing of the self, changing of behavior, that leads to restoration. And then the third sort of um, clause or idea that he really explores is this idea that Jesus will be the ruler of the kings of the earth, which is a callback to Ezekiel 39. And um, and really what this is looking at is that the kings here are representing sort of like God's enemies on the earth. And these would be the people who have all the power and who are not using that in the way that God wants them to use that. It's, it's, it's those who are uh, oppressing the world basically and, and hoarding resources and using violence and fear to get what they want and all, all that kind of thing. And, um, and so, you know, when you look at the world, it doesn't look like Jesus is ruling these rulers. Uh, it looks like they're quite very much in charge of themselves and and uh, that, you know, Jesus doesn't really have much say so at all in any of this. And what Greg argues is that, no, in fact, what the book of Revelation teaches is that what's happening there is that these rulers are not hot, as, as much of a hotshot as they seem. They are, in fact, simply pawns in a much bigger game. And so when you have this climactic scene where uh, there is this great Armageddon battle and you have Jesus and his army against the rulers of the world, what you find is that um, Jesus ends up slaying them with this sword coming out of his mouth. And Greg talks for a while about some of the violent imagery and how some people like Mark Driscoll has have taken that to uh, – they've interpreted that as Jesus actually taking a sword and slaughtering his enemies and, and shedding blood. But when you actually look at the text carefully, you see that it, that's not the case at all. In fact, it's the opposite of that. The sword that, that – Jesus slaughters his enemies with is the truth that Jesus speaks. When the when reality is revealed to the kings, 
reality is what slaughters them. Reality is what tears down all the falsehood and all the self-delusion that has compelled them to do what God's enemy has always wanted them to do, which is to oppress and to kill and to steal and to destroy all of these things. And when they realize that they are not the hotshots that they think they were, but in fact, they were just being used, when they realize the damage that they've done, the kings fall, they will be slaughtered by that truth. And then, you know, you see how even that leads to uh, restoration because uh, it's implied in Revelations 20, 24, when these kings reappear and they are leading their people into God's kingdom, uh, what's implied there is that, that that being slaughtered by the truth is actually what ultimately leads them to repentance and restoration and allows them to bring their people into God's kingdom. And then Greg just finishes the sermon on that note uh, by pointing out that you know, look, these are these are the people who on the earth are considered God's foes because they are uh, living contrary and they have all the power to kind of thwart and to disrupt what God is trying to do here. But if even they are, uh, you know, exp if even they can wail and repent and be restored, well, then I mean, there's hope for all of us then. If, if the people who are, are you know, are marked in Revelation as God's earthly foes, if even they will repent and be restored, there is hope for all of us. And I thought that was a very, um, a very important uh, close of the sermon because I think a lot of people do doubt uh, whether or not they're saved and whether or not there's hope for themselves and stuff like that. But also it shows again, that this book is very, very hopeful. It, it is not this dark book that that we often assume that it is. And uh, so, yeah, that's my summary. What did you think of Greg's message? Thank you, Dan. Good job. I enjoy Greg's message because I always appreciate when you take these, um, as you call them, three phrases, these three metaphors, when you take things like this and break them down for, for folks, Hi, I'm folks. When you take things like this and break it down for folks, I think it demystifies the book and you're able to get at the heart of the message, which is which is a message of hope. And I think mm -hmm. so many times, and we've talked, you know, about this, like with Revelation, so many times people have taken this apocalyptic literature and just read um <laughs> read it um you know very um what's the word i'm looking for it's escaping me now i need more coffee um literally that's the literally, word thank you yes. for that help dan <laughs> I, I i did nothing <laughs> well i didn't know what you were trying to say <laughs> <laughs> okay listen do we need to record later in the day i mean because why don't you just call me after you have your coffee and then we rec we can record so that's <laughs> i know i know okay okay i'm gonna step it up literally <laughs> when they take it literally and just kind of the mess that can cause and so again remember we're learning to love together we're learning together all of this stuff and so i really appreciated the way that greg broke that down um not only just said old testament don't have time to get there but he actually went in and yeah. showed us i thought that was really helpful and then ending with the message of hope. I just loved that because I agree. I think that there are many people who berate themselves, beat themselves up, question their salvation. And that comes from some religious baggage, I'm sure. And just feeling like anytime you mess up, you're about to fall out of God's grace. And, and then um, I, I just think that was really hopeful. And also the challenge and the encouragement to look at others <clears throat> that we whatever that we are, um, I'm going to say judging, and I don't mean that negatively, but that we are determining that are outside of the will of God or uh, not believers, that we look at them as um, pre-believers, like not believers yet. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really powerful thing to do. And in the yeah. meantime, that we just continue to hope and pray and believe the best for them and that they will come into God's grace. And uh, I think that also gets personal because I know that we all have people in our lives that we just start that are, you know, can be whatever, anywhere from annoying to really damaging, traumatizing, whatever. And if we can, um, from a, from a safe distance, just remember that person is a work in progress and, and God is at work in their life and just pray to that end. I think that's helpful. So yeah, a little all over the place with that, but I just, I did love that he ended with, um, 
the message of hope. Um, and that's hope for us. It's hope for others. It's hope for um, the animal kingdom and the earth and really, really appreciated the breakdown um, because I think the, the visions that we're getting into can, you know, trip us up and they can get a little confusing. And so I think it's important to just unpack those a bit for everyone. And again, yeah. hi, I'm everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone, folks. Hi, thank you. So, thank yes. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think uh, a couple of things. One, we do all have people in our lives like that, and many of us are going to see them in two days. <laughs> That's the first thing. The <laughs> second thing, uh, the second thing is um, I also agree that the, his, um, I appreciated his kind of exploration of the links between what we're doing now in the old testament because you know one of the things that that i have said and that greg has said and we've all said uh on the team is that you know what john is doing with this crazy imagery is tapping back to the old testament he's not he, he he's tapping to the past he's not predicting the future and 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 you see the beauty of what he's saying when you actually read it with what he is trying to do, which is he's trying to connect it with what uh, his audience already knew and anticipated and expected. And so you see, you know, uh, whether it's the, the book of Daniel, Zechariah or Ezekiel, he he gives these examples of how each of these ideas are connected to the past. And, and that's definitely something that I want to see us do more and more as we continue in this uh, series for sure. Yeah. And as an aside, and this has really nothing to do with Revelation other than to reiterate the point you just made, I think it helps people who maybe don't have a great relationship with the Old Testament scriptures yeah. to kind of connect those dots and to maybe recover some of that. And, and let me just say, if you do have a difficult relationship with Old Testament scriptures, I get it. I understand. <laughs> but I do think this helps to see like how it all fits together. It is a grand part of God's entire story. So I love that. Yeah. Um, so that was just an aside. So Dan, okay, we do, I think it would be good for us to talk a little bit about, um, some of the ways that some of this has been misinterpreted. And I'm just going to say this. Okay. First of all, we do have a question, um, that kind of is, uh, dealing with something we were talking about last week and last week's sermon. So we will get to that, but, but first I want to talk about, and Greg mentioned it, um, uh, a famous preacher who has uh, described this Jesus coming with the sword and just the slaughter that's about to happen. And um, I, I want to I want to explore that a little bit because I think that's not a a a uncommon um, view of this. It's not an uncommon interpretation of yeah. of the text. I'm not saying it's <laughs> I don't think it's a correct interpretation, but many people do have that. The best way I can explain it is Avengers. Like I remember sitting in the theater mm -hmm. watching a, a, Avengers Endgame or was it Infinity War? Mm -hmm. I forget. Someone correct me later. But it looks like Thanos wins, right? He has, I mean, it just looks like he is all powerful and and he he's won. The enemy has won and it's awful and it's terrible and poor. Cap is just like, he's just, he's fought all that he can fight and he has nothing left to give. And then all of a sudden you hear this on your left and then all the folks who got like dusted away in the blip come through and you see Black Panther and all these other Avengers coming through and then this huge battle and then woo, we win. like, why not Jesus? Why not? Why is that not the case for Jesus? Yeah. Why isn't he the Avenger that comes through and just kicks all the tail and like victory? It's so glorious. Why yeah. Not? <laughs> yeah. Uh, th it's a, it's a good question. And, you know, uh, Greg is definitely interacting with Mark Driscoll there and, and Mark's uh, interpretation of, of revelation. And as you, if you listen to Mark, it, you know, I disagree with Mark's theology, but, uh, and I, I also um, am bothered by some of, uh, his tone toward, uh, you know, about, you know, men and women and genders women. and stuff like yeah. that. And I feel like um, I'm always sending you little TikToks of things. This <laughs> right. is. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I also like to try to, you know, uh, understand where he's coming from, uh, as, as empathetic as possible. And, and I, you know, I, he is very much about, he, he longs, like, I think all of us do, he longs for, a God who takes action and he longs for the, 
problems of the world to just be thoroughly conquered and um in a way that kind of like you know a farmer would go out into his field and just mow the hay let's the here's the hay we got to get it done we get her done you know yeah. get up early and put yourself to it and just get her done and that's yeah. just a very masculine sort of thing and mm -hmm. and I, I i think that that's um i think that there's definitely some projection like this is what we want god to do too yeah. and um and god's not just about getting it done god is about uh a, a relationship god is about uh, uh, kind of a, a synergetic sort of thing where it's not what God wants to get done. It's what God wants all of us to get done together. And, and if there is that inherent togetherness, if it is a body of Christ, if it is a community, if it is his bride and him in this uh, synergetic relationship, then he can't just bulldoze through and get it done because that's not what his objective is. His objective is for us to do it together in this synergetic sort of way. And uh, to just bulldoze over people uh, actually sabotages what God is trying to do, and that is to have this uh, relationship between these two uh autonomous agents so you could have this authentic love relationship and um and so it has to there there is you know in people like mark and in some of these theologies i sense this uh thing that i understand so deeply and that is there is this impatience with mm -hmm. the world there's this impatience with the people of the world and and the people who uh, we interpret as you're you're holding up the show. If you would just get your act together, uh, and if you don't get your act together, God's going to get it together for you. And I, man, I get that impatience. Like I just want God to come with His broom and with His dustpan and just clean house. You know, let's get this ship back. Uh, and I get that. I I really want that. But uh, God's not going for something so simple. He's really looking at something much more beautiful and intricate and real and authentic that requires us to be more patient, first of all, with the world, and also more introspective about what are we actually contributing to this? What are we doing that is keeping the show from unfolding the way that God wants it to unfold? Mm -hmm. And um, and so that's that's what I would say about that. Yeah. That was beautifully said, Dan. And in case anyone was wondering, I I, I do not subscribe to <laughs> that interpretation. Really? I love huh. kind of, I know, shocking. I love yeah. me some Avengers, but I, <laughs> I'm not yeah. saying I want that to be Jesus. Um, I do too. I think that also, I mean, Jesus is constantly surprising us folks during his time us today like flipping things upside down it's like you think it's this but it's this you know it's lion versus lamb it's it, he the way that he fights is very different than when we think fight and i think if anything is taught us, if anything has taught us anything in our time here on earth and looking at history it's like what does violence solve really yeah eternally like what does it solve like you may think hey, we kick their tail and we got over on them whether it's person versus person city versus city nation versus nation like what it never ever ever solves permanently the issue and so maybe jesus is up to something a little different there when he approaches things um, a little differently yeah Leads me to my next question. And, um, oh, wait, first I want to circle back because I love it when you talked about a God who takes action and pe many people are longing for that. And I don't think it's yeah. just dudes. I think, I think <laughs> right. humanity, you know, longs for that. Like we see injustices, we think we see the way things have gone awry and we definitely long for the redemption of Jesus to come and to make all things right. And how we want that done, that varies. How we think that's going to happen, that varies. But I do think at the end of it, we do all want that. And I have heard literal um, gentlemen in Woodland Hills Church um, when we've been talking about this kind of stuff, and this was years ago, but I've literally heard a guy just honestly say, I just really struggle with the idea of following a wimpy savior a wimpy yeah. jesus and i'm like i i get that but it was also that same character as the one who sacrificed himself for all of us so right. you know and I, and so i'm not belittling i i understand yeah. that struggle for some and i think that's something that we can say out loud and acknowledge but yeah. it doesn't mean that we need to stay there well and that's you know and i get that too and i, I think that's well said I, I just for me like 
as I've thought about it, especially as you think about the nonviolence thing and and you 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 think of like, OK, uh, your enemy strikes you and God is calling us to turn the other cheek to uh, let go of and to just, you know, disregard all of that kind of volcano of impulse inside of us that is pushing us at gunpoint to fight back. And we're supposed to just disregard all of that and continue to face the belittling treatment of our enemy um, because God is saying that this is the, the process through which he is going to ultimately accomplish what he wants to accomplish in his creation. And you might not ever see that in this lifetime, uh, yet that's what you're called to do. I look at that and I'm I'm like, that takes a profound amount of courage and security and trust in God that any wimp can just pick up a stick and and strike back. I mean, that's that to me is like that's a very wimpy sort of thing. And so when I look at Jesus and 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 I look at his nonviolent life, uh, I look at that and I say, I don't know if I'm strong enough and courageous enough to do that. I would rather just pick up a gun and shoot back. That's what I want to do. And that's because not because I'm strong or manly. It's because I'm terrified. I'm a coward and I'm weak. And and to exalt my own cowardliness as something that God should do, boy, that is, uh, whew, that is more than heresy. I don't know what that is, but it, it, it's, um, it, again, uh, we could all use some introspection on, on all of that, but. Amen. Amen. Beautifully said, Dan, this brings me to something that, um, that I feel like comes up quite a bit, like in the different classes that we teach and when people are like discovering more about Woodland Hills and wanting to become covenant partners and stuff. And we, we are very out loud, um, about our Anabaptist ties and, and our commitment to nonviolence. And so people will read these kinds of things and see like all the kind of war language. And, and for some, it's hard to reconcile. Like if we are anti-violence and why is there all this language about spiritual warfare and the mm -hmm. battle and everything? And so what would, what would you say about that? I mean, it's, yeah. it's kind of like a broader scope question. Yeah. Well, I, I think that we are, in fact, made for war, but it's not war with each other, first of all. And uh, it's secondly, it's not um, it's not a type of war where uh, we, God doesn't want us to fight in a way that sabotages our own spirit. He doesn't want us to do something that kind of defeats the whole purpose. It's it, it's it's uh, if God's goal is the restoration of all things, if God's goal is the reconciliation of his creation to himself, well, it, it destroying his creation actually gets in the way of what God is trying to do. And so what God is calling us to is a, it's a type of warfare that I think is more courageous. Like I said, where you have to, you have to be patient and you have to just trust that you might not get what you want out of the immediate circumstance, but we have to trust that God's promises that we will be with him, that he will wipe away every tear, that what he has in store for us makes whatever suffering we have in this life look ridiculous. If we trust those things, then we can uh, engage in, I think, a much more courageous type of warfare, which involves patience and love and tolerance and so forth. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I think it absolutely Absolutely is war. It's just that as soon as we resort to violence, we have lost because we have been duped into fighting a war that we are not meant to fight. We have been uh, kind of uh, turned into the puppets of the enemy by even just fighting and being violent and seeking to destroy. That is what the enemy does to to steal, kill, and destroy. So if we're doing that, guess what? We've already lost. We are now working for the enemy. And so, yeah, it's a type of warfare, but it's it's um, it's not the enemy's warfare. Uh, it, it, it's warfare on the terms that the Lord has given us, that, that our commanding officer has given us. And uh, it takes great courage and trust in God in order to, to fight it. And, and, and I say this, and I don't mean to sound like I am, you know, <laughs> I'm there because I... I, you know, the violence is very tempting and I, yeah. and I don't know what I will do in actual circumstances. And I hope that I can, um, obey this high call that God has for me. And I hope that in, in if a circumstance were to come up that I could trust in this way, because I do believe it in my head, uh, 
but uh, this is why the Lord's Prayer says, lead us not into temptation and testing. I don't want to be tested on this because, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I might kind of suddenly, you know, seek out Mark Driscoll if this, if circumstances were <laughs> just right, you know. But yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So all of that to say, I think what the scripture teaches us is a different type of warfare, and it requires more courage, not less, and it requires more trust in God, not less. And um, so that's what I would say about that. Good job. Thank you. I, um, yeah, no, I, I think people are hearing your heart in all of this. And so no worries there. And it is, it's one thing to like have this in our head and to, and to, for it to make sense. Um, we know it's countercultural, but to know that it makes sense and to know that that is the way, but then when you're confronted with it and how you react in a moment, that's really where, you know, um, proof is in the pudding rubber meets the road. <laughs> right. And guess what? We're not all going to respond 100%, um, right. you know, the proper way. I don't, I don't think, cause we're, we're still like working this stuff out. So, yeah. um, hopefully that's where we can like lean on one another as a community and like help one another. And where one of us is, is having weak moments, another can be strong. And so that's the beauty of it. Dan, I have one more point of discussion from Greg's sermon from Sunday. And then we do have that uh, throwback question from last week. Sounds Are good. you up for that, sir? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, perfect. One of the things I really appreciated, like I said, after your sermon was just how Greg unpacked these three phrases and what you saw there again was just how what we keep always saying things are not what they seem. So you, you, you read this and you hear this and you think, oh my goodness, um, he's coming on the clouds. That obviously means this. And you no, actually it doesn't. Let's look a little deeper. And then the tribes will wail. I think we've I shouldn't say, I, I know many who have just like thought they understood what that meant, you know, and why the wailing was happening and it turns, turns out, nope, it's something different. Like we got to look a little deeper and the same for the ruler of the Kings of earth. And so that to me was so refreshing and hopeful. And yet I know, um, and again, this isn't coming from a, a point of judgment, but I do know so many people like, no, they feel like people, they need to wail. They need to be punished. They need to suffer right. for their choices and what they've done. And, and then when Greg starts speaking, hopefully about, hey, even rulers um, had opportunity to repent and many did, like that really makes people nervous. And we even yeah. saw in the chat on Sunday, like people get real nervous when Greg is extending that grace of God and that hopeful salvation to people. Um what do you think is that within, I don't know if it's just humanity, if, I don't know what it is, but like we have this sense of no, no, right needs to be rewarded, wrong needs to be punished. Mm -hmm. And the wailing was, you know, let's yeah. not reinterpret that. Let's just let it be what the way we've always thought it to be. Yeah. Uh, did you have your coffee? Because holy cow, these questions are like, like top shelf questions. <laughs> these are really. It's, it's seeping in, man. It's seeping man. in. <laughs> Holy cow. Um, yeah. So I, I, here's what I would say is uh, if you're reading the, the, they will wail passage and you're assuming that, you know, you know, you and your friends will be over here and those people will be over there wailing. I think you're missing the text because I assume at least that I, I will be part of the whalers. I will be, I will be, uh, I will have my eyes opened to how I contributed to the piercing of, God. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, so I just assume that. Um, and, and so that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is um, the, the people who are wailing are the ones who repented and ultimately are restored. And so I think that it's, it, it, you want to be part of the wailers. You want to be part of the people whose hearts are still soft enough to wail at what they did. And, um, and so I, that's the second thing. The third thing I would say is that uh, I think we do long for um bad behavior to be corrected is what we want we we want people and we want ourselves to genuinely be good people we 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 want when the master comes and says well done good and faithful servant we want that to be genuine we want that to be us we want that to be because we have become good and faithful servants and and if we're not there um, if we if we long for God, if we're seeking God, if we have a heart for God, uh, I think that we 
we want to experience whatever we have to experience, whatever fires, whatever purging fires, whatever corrections we have to experience to, to get to that point. Um, uh, we want that. And, and, um, and th there are verses in the old Testament. I don't have them memorized right now, but uh, that talks about how um, the Lord, you know, punishes those he loves. And um, now we in, you know, we think of punishment as an end in itself. Like that's what you deserve. You did this, you do the crime, you, you, you pay your time. I mean, that's, that's, that's the consequence of the behavior. It's a, a price you have to pay for what you did. And in the scriptures, it's never a price you pay for what you did. It's always a corrective measure so that you don't do it again. It's a corrective measure to expose to you uh, why what you did was wrong. It's to teach you to be more godly. It's to show you uh, that what you thought was good was actually not good. What you thought was no big deal might actually be a big deal. It's, it's to show you all of that on this very deep way so that you can be a good and faithful servant. And... Um, and so, but we have very shallow, dumbed down understandings of rewards and punishments. Uh, it, it, we think of rewards as something that God gives us because we were good boys and good girls. Uh, that's that's like the inverse of you do the crime, you do the time. It's just this very shallow understanding. And that's what the world operates on. But God is calling us into something much deeper, much more profound, where the relationship itself is the reward. It is the thing that we are made for. And um, and we hurt when that is not right. And, and, and so the punishment is just part of the fact that we are not uh, where we want to be with God. And, and so, yeah, that's, that's what I would say uh, about all of that. Did that make sense? I felt like it was kind of, I was no. out of my head yeah. there a little bit, but. So I did a, the very Minnesotan thing. I said, no. Yeah. Meaning <laughs> yes, it makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. No. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It did. It did. I think you sense. need to do two yes because a negative and a positive is a negative. I think okay. if I remember so right. No. Yeah. Yeah. Th there you go. Okay. Yeah, now we're good. Yeah. Now we're good. There we go. Yeah. And I would just add to that. I think if you could, I think it's always good to like turn turn inward and and reflect and say remember those times. I think we've probably all had them when we have come to the realization of oh man we messed up and maybe we didn't initially realize it. Oh, oh man, we hurt someone. Are we like, yeah. when you come to that realization of what you've done and you're like, oh man, you know, yeah. the sorrow can be great. And and by great, I mean, huge, you know, yeah. um, think about your own salvation. You know, like when you've, when you've come to the end of yourself and you're like, oh man, like that is a powerful moment. And and the grace that was extended to us, I would hope that we would want that extended to all because we'll, that's that's the better place to be when we are all, you know, living in and because of his grace. So that would be my only addition to your yeah, that's good. really good answer. Okay, sir. So last question, uh, throwback to last week about the seven spirit. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about that, <laughs> about the seven spirits um, and referring to the Holy Spirit. And the question is, is there still some confusion there? Why not just say the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Like, why are we yep. saying seven spirits? Yeah, it's really, it is confusing from us because we are on the other end of 2000 years of theology. So that's what we would say. We would just say the Holy Spirit. Um, but it, we, we, what you see is when you're reading that is John, they didn't have this idea of Trinity yet. And everyone in the New Testament still refers to, to God specifically as God the Father. And um, and so what what you find is uh, John, are, he's doing these things in the text, partly in his greeting uh, to the seven churches, for instance, where he is he is making it clear that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are part of God. They are God. and uh, But the, he doesn't have that Trinity language yet. And so he does all of these other things. And and the fact is, is that he does recognize the Spirit and Jesus uh, and the Father all as God. But he also recognizes, like a good Trinitarian theologian before he had the language for it, he also recognizes there's something distinct about Jesus, and there's something distinct about the Spirit, and there's something distinct about the Father. And um, and so part of what he talks about when he talks about the seven spirits, he's talking about part of what's distinct about uh, the Spirit. And the seven there represents this, this perfect sort of spirit and uh, 
that implies God. And so whatever, like some of the confusion around that has to do with the fact that um, these are these are monotheistic Jews who are just grappling with this idea that Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit are all God, and they don't have that language clear yet. But the way that he he frames the text is pretty clear that he yeah he's saying that it's all God, uh, even though he maintains a different language for each uh, person. So that's what I would say about that. Good job. All right, Dan, I'm going to give you a high five. Do high all right, five hold on. Let me, please. you know, we got to switch five. the high five camera. Okay, here we go. Yeah, ready? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Good so. job. I, I I took you through it today and you Boy, were a trooper. Did you ever. I got to take a nap. <laughs> gotta t- man. <laughs> okay. So for today's nugget time, come on, let me see it. Get ready. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> for today's nugget time, let's make it short and sweet um, yep. and send these good folks on to the rest of their blessings. Yeah. I'm not even switching the camera. I'm just, I'm staying in high five mode here. I, I will it. say, um, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, this is what I would say. Um, the fact that since there's hope for the kings that were God's earthly foes and there's hope for them for restoration, there's hope for all of us, which is not to say that there's nothing for us to do uh, because they all had to, you know, repent and restore and all that kind of stuff. But what that means is that we can pursue God. We can pursue repentance and restoration without anxiety. We can trust that if God started a good work in us, he will see it through to completion. And we can pursue God with peace and joy, not with that anxious kind of terror uh, that um, I see a lot of people seem to have around this. So that would be my nugget. I love it. And mine is very similar. Um, And I'm just going to say, lean into hope, lean into hope, because that same Jesus who was able to do incredible, beautiful things while on earth and the same Jesus who is represented in Revelation, who, you know, uh, kings and leaders and, you know, fall before once they realize the error of their ways, that same Jesus is with us here and now today. And he is with you as you go throughout the rest of your week. And for those of you who are going to be encountering neighbors, family members, whatever, in the next few days where it may be difficult, lean into hope. For those of you who this is a lonely or a sad time, you know, and and you feel sorrow and, and, and grief, like lean into hope. Wherever you find yourself, know that Jesus is with you. That same Jesus, he is with you here now. He has come and he is with us. So lean into his hope. Indeed. Good word. Amen. All right, you guys have a great week. We are thankful yes. for you and our gratitude overflows for <laughs> the MuseCast folks, the MuseCast peeps, the MuseCast community. Thank you. We look forward to chatting with you later. Have a great rest of your week. Happy Thanksgiving to those who celebrate and we will see you next week. All right.